Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kurt Jordan. I'm the director of the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program uh, at Cornell University. Um, and I'll be introducing our speaker, Jamie Jacobs, today. I'll start off with a land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono, or the Cuban Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people past and present to these lands and waters. Our speaker today is from the neighboring Haudenosaunee Nation, the Onondawaka, or the Seneca Nation. Cornell has also directly impacted Onondawaka territory and people. Uh, the Agritech facility in Geneva sits directly on an Onondawaka town that was destroyed during the 1779 American Salt and Clinton ex invasion of Haudenosaunee territory. We, I'd like to, of course, recognize the importance of the 1794 uh, Treaty of Canandaigua, which is a keystone in the relationship between the United States and the Six Nations of the Haudenosaunee, in which that federally ratified treaty, which is the supreme law of the land according to the U.S. Constitution, recognized the sovereignty and ongoing relation, uh, the sovereignty of the Six Nations and the ongoing relationship between the United States and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. This event is commemorated every year on November 11th in Canandaigua itself, and I think Jamie will give us the details about how it's going to happen this year. And it's been a regular thing for uh, the American Indian and Indigenous Studies program to have a teach-in uh, about the importance of this event uh, every year as sort of a precursor for uh, the, the commemoration ceremony uh, that takes place on the 11th. So it's certainly my pleasure to welcome Jamie Jacobs back to Cornell. I've known Jamie for a long time. He's from the Onondawaka territory at Tonawanda. Uh, he's a member of the Turtle Clan. Uh, uh, during the day, or at least some parts of the day, he's an assistant curator for the Rock Foundation collections, which are housed at the Rochester Museum and Science Center. And he's been involved in repatriation and also in providing access to community members to these very important collections. He's a knowledge holder for the Tonawanda community. This role includes numerous skills and responsibilities, including being a, a, a highly proficient traditional artist, a speaker of the Onondawaka language and an orator uh, for Onondawaka traditions and ceremonies. So please join me in welcoming Jamie Jacobs. <clears throat> <Thanks, Coach. clears throat> uh, uh, just a little correction there. I've actually worked my way up to managing curator of the Rock Foundation uh, at RMSC. Um, so I, after uh, about 13 years, I finally was um, looked at and looked at as worthy enough to take over as the manager. Um, so I'm very happy. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, this uh, time change has has me going a little bonkers here because I look outside and it's getting uh, almost dark out. So I'm driving on the road and I'm thinking, man, am I really late? because it seems like it's almost dark outside. But I had a really good road, um, and we always start off our traditions by thanking uh, our creator that we were able to travel on you know, such a good road uh, for me to get here. So in my language, uh, we always say, uh, uh, so I uh, thank the Creator that I was able to um, arrive here safely. So uh, what I've been asked here to do tonight is to give um, a presentation on the Canadago Treaty. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it on the perspective of, um, I guess, the Seneca and uh, Haudenosaunee uh, people, uh, mainly because there's, there's 
quite a bit of scholarly knowledge out there already that uh, can be accessed, you know, quite easily on, you know, libraries and, you know, history books and the internet. Uh, so what I wanted to provide today is uh, a perspective on the Seneca uh, and Haudenosaunee uh, people. Uh, the photograph you're looking at is from the glass plate negatives of a man named Albert Stone. Uh, Albert Stone uh, was a photographer who worked in the early 20th century. And what he did was he would go out and take photographs and then he would bring them back to the different uh, newspaper outlets in Rochester and he would sell um, his glass plate negatives uh, to the different newspapers. And sometimes he did uh, also like he worked for them. Uh, but this one here, uh, he went out to my home community in the early years of uh, 1901 to around 1908. And he snapped uh, glass plate negatives. Um, and while he was there, he had heard of a man um, by the name of Charles Johnson uh, living in Tonawanda. And one of the things that interest him was that he had heard that Charles Johnson had a copy of the Canandaigua Treaty and he wanted to know if this was true. So he had sought out this man. Uh, Charles Johnson was of the Wolf Clan uh, and he didn't speak any English. Uh, he only spoke uh, Seneca. So he had to find an interpreter. The interpreter took him over to see Charles Johnson and at the time he lived in this little log cabin there and he asked the interpreter to ask Charles Johnson whether or not it was true that he had this relic of you know US and Haudenosaunee history. So Charles Johnson um, went into the house and he come back out and he had it folded up uh, like a pamphlet. Uh, as you can see here you can see the folds uh, in the uh, vellum um, that's, that's, uh, that the treaty was written on. So he unfolded it and Albert Stone was uh, taken back by this gesture. Uh, but not only that, he was taken back by the fact that, you know, here it was, uh, the rumor was true. And he in fact um, was very happy to have seen um, that there was a surviving copy of this uh, treaty. Um, the term uh, Canandaigua uh, is actually kind of a corrupt term of the Seneca term. Uh, and the Seneca term is actually pronounced Gonondagwe. So when we say ga, that's like, I guess in linguistic terms, sometimes we refer to it as the agent or we refer to it as the subjective pronoun. Uh, and I guess in Seneca, uh, it's, it's usually referred to as the or the, I guess if you want to think about it that way. Um, and it has the, uh, the noun root for town or village, uh, which is the nunda. Um, and then we have the verb root for gue. Um, it's actually go. Uh, and what it means is to m take one thing and then move it into a different spot. That's literally what it means. And I guess if you do that, in a sense, uh, you choose something out. So if there's something lined up, you take one thing out and you set it into a different spot, um, you're, you're choosing it out. So that's literally what it means, is the town that's been taken from one spot and put into another, uh, I guess. And what you have is what, uh, you have a chosen town or the chosen town, Gonondagwe. Uh, uh, and that's how we pronounce it. Um, we have a word for treaty, and the word for treaty is we say uh, So again, uh, if I break it down, uh, we say de, which is what we call a duplicative in linguistic terms, because there's two sides uh, to uh, any treaty. The ga would be the, uh, again, it would be the it would be the subjective pronoun for it. Uh, and we have uh, the yon, which means to enter or to like arrive at something. And then the uh, ak, 
would be our instrumental uh, suffix. It means to use it for that. And then the on would be what, what we call a state of suffix. So when we have the gayon dahkum, literally what it means is two things that use it to arrive at. Um, that's really what that means. And uh, we have a word for uh, wampum belt. And we have the word, what we say is And again, this word is really hard to translate because it's, it goes back to a time when our ancestors, they produced the wampum and they produced wampum in great quantities at a certain time. And then they wove those wampum beads uh, into, I guess in English, what we call as a wampum belt. Um, and that's what our word is for that. And sometimes it's confused because they often use the term and they've attached it to uh, the two row. And that's what people go, call gaswenta. But really gaswenta is, is, is what the wampum belt would be for um, this degayon uh, this treaty. Uh, so I kind of just want to give a little bit of, uh, again, like cultural info, uh, because this treaty, this English term treaty, is, it's, it's often applied for, like when we have European and uh, native you know, entities coming together to enter some kind of agreement. But in reality, it's, it's for all humans, you know, at some point they all come to an agreement on something uh, throughout all of our history. Uh, but when it comes to Haudenosaunee, um, we often think of, you know, wampum belts. And again, that term belt, it's, it, it, it really kind of, um, to me personally, um, it, it kind of really digs at me because in the language, it, it has nothing to do with a belt. Um, so here we have a, a, a very large and wide wampum belt. Um, but in the language, we would say gaswenta. And in this particular one has a design. And if I were to turn it up, um, it would kind of have like this rudimentary shape of like a pine tree. Um, and the pine tree goes back to the formation of the league or what we call Ganoshonido. And even the term Hodinoshoni, it's often translated throughout like the different languages uh, and has different variations as to how it's translated. Uh, but when we think of the ceremonial context of the word and how it's used, and when we think even, you know, since I've been working at the RMSC, uh, the Rock Foundation has a very elaborate and profound collect archaeological collection and archaeolo archaeological record of the Seneca people, uh, which can be used to study not just the Seneca, but uh, all the Haudenosaunee nations. So the term Ganoshonido is the term that they'll use in the ceremonial uh, recitation of how the league was formed. Uh, they don't often use the term Hodinoshoni in that context. And what they'll often say is they'll say Hodinoshoni do. So linguistically what that means is when we say Hodi, it usually means it to them. So in this case, it would, uh, the them would be the people of the land. And it to them, um, what's happening is sometimes they'll translate it and say the house is extended and they are of the longhouse. Uh, but in reality, the ceremonial context, what it really says is it says the house because they own the house. So hodinos, and then we have this verb root, yoni. So the S and the Y come together to form that sh sound. And the yoni means to extend. But then we have what we call sometimes, we have these uh, suffixes that are added. And the suffix that added in a ceremonial context that you don't often hear uh, is, the, is the, the T. And what, is, is, uh, what it is, is it, it's a causative suffix. And then we have the um, state of aspect of it, which is the on. So the T and the on come together to form the don sound. 
So what that really means is it really means that something has caused the house to extend to them. And what it is is uh, the chaos. And the chaos is what we often hear about in the formation of the league. So that's really what that means is Hodino Shoni is, they'll translate it today as people of the longhouse. And that's actually a um, anthropological translation. And we first see it in um, the early publications of the history of the league in different area uh, and by different authors uh, such as Caldwell or Cauldron which is you know one of the earliest ones uh, in the early 1720s and then later on uh, Lewis Henry Morgan um, kind of defines it uh, redefines it and publishes it in the mid 19th century and then it becomes popular after that Hodino Shoni uh, people of the longhouse but in the ceremonial context uh, what it really means is that the house has become has caused to become extended uh, to them, and what it is and what causes it is um, this perpetual warfare or chaos. <clears throat> so here we have uh, you know another identifiable uh, belt or goswenta. Uh, this is the wampum belt of the Onondaga people. Uh, and sometimes they'll say that there's 14 diamonds that represents the 14 sachem chiefs of the Onondaga people. Uh, but in reality, this belt was much longer. When you see it in person, you can definitely tell that the warps on the ends have been cut. And in earlier photographs, we actually see 16 diamonds and not 14. And even in that photograph, you can still see one end that's been trimmed off uh, on the wefts. Um, so we know that it was longer than 14. But again, it just shows us the idea that when, from a Haudenosaunee perspective, um, when we look at this wampum, uh, we can start to see where and how, why the term we say, <laughs> uh, so this one here is the George Washington belt. Um, this one here is the one that was um, George Washington, as the story goes, had commissioned two Oneida women uh, to produce this belt for the Canandaigua Treaty uh, that would take place in uh, 1794. Uh, but from a Haudenosaunee perspective, um, this belt is the traditional way of what occurs when we say de Gaillon d'Arcon. Uh, two parties that are coming in and using it to enter uh, something with. And I guess the something in this case would be peace. Or in our language we say scan uh, Again, um, ceremonially this belt is recited. And again, it's it, to try and do my best to correct um, the way that this belt has been read over time. And the way that this belt has been read, which has become popularized, is based on um, anthropological uh, views. And what they're doing is these anthropologists are studying different translations and then they're putting this conglomeration together into one and then they publish it. And people read books more than they understand uh, Haudenosaunee language. And because that's the, what they know, uh, they become familiarized with it. But uh, traditionally, this belt, the way it's read, is in the middle we have a house. And you can see that within the house we have uh, beams. But the way that this belt was read by the traditional chief John Buck is he says that within the house there's actually two houses. Again, the Gayon Dakon. So he says that on what you're seeing is you're seeing a wider house. And then on the inside, when you see the beams reaching up to the roof that are supporting the roof, he says that's the Haudenosaunee. Um, I guess he goes, that's, that's the longhouse. He says, and the reason why they're like that is because it shows that the roof of each house, the roof of the United States government 
and the ruling body of, those, of, of that nation stands equal with the standing structure of what we call Ganoshonido. So he says, when you see the house in the center, he says it's actually two houses, de Gayondako. We have the ruling house of our brothers, the 13 colonies, and the equal level height of the house of us, the Hodino Shonido. So he says each house has a set government. He says our white brothers have come to realize that they need a ruling law to govern them. And we also have that as well. In our language, the symbol of the longhouse that sets this, what we call Guyana's hat Goa, in the language we have another wampum belt that they call, uh, they call it Jonodagan uh, Goa. And what that means is the great white mat. So that's what you're seeing in the center. Some people often refer to it as a window, uh, but what it is, it's, it's, it's the mat that represents the law. And this mat and the law is what governs each house. Also in the Hodinoshoni, or the story of Gonoshonido, we have, a sto we have what we call oral tradition and the coming of the peacemaker. The peacemaker, again, ceremonially, um, he has a name, but we don't pronounce that name only at certain times when the great law is being recited or at a ceremonial um, raising of a new sachem chief in what we call a condolence. The peacemaker is referred to as, we say, and what that means is he's bringing the good mind, and that's how we refer to him. So what he does is he sets symbols. And one of the symbols is the great white pine tree, which represents peace. And he says that these boughs, these branches reach out and they provide shade. And anyone who wishes to be sheltered by the great tree of peace will find this shelter of peace under its branches. So what you're seeing on the outside of the house are the leaders who govern each house, who look after the house. So on one side you have Tadodaho, uh, which would be the one who oversees the house of the Ganoshonido. On the other side of the house, you have, again, an equal height, the one who keeps that house in order of our white brothers. And we call him Hanandaganyas, or the president of the United States. So the first president, I guess, of this new form nation uh, would be George Washington. So Tadodaho and George Washington, just like the two houses in the center, are standing equal height. Uh, and this equal height is a reverberating term that you hear all throughout the Haudenosaunee um, culture. The 50 sachems that the peacemaker stood up, that's what he said, is he says, and what that means is uh, you all stand in equal height. One of the sachem chiefs of the Senecas is we say, uh, and what that means is two skies that are long, but they're equal. So we hear this term all throughout Haudenosaunee um, culture and throughout all our ceremonial speeches, this idea of two things that are of equal height. Again, something that is essential for the Gayon Dakon, two things that are entering into an agreement. The uh, shapes that you see that are over on top of them are the branches of the great white pine tree and they're being sheltered. And they're being sheltered because they've agreed that the thing that they are using to enter an agreement with is peace, uh, scano. And then you have the 13 colonies, um, which are joining arms 
on the outer um, flanking these, the, the middle figures. Again, this whole idea of linking arms. Today, the populi popularized term is the covenant chain. But again, the peacemaker, when he forms the confederacy, and when he finally has stood up 50 sachems of these five nations, one of the things that he says to them after he stands up and plants the great white pine tree is he says to the 50 sachems, he says, Now you all stand. So he says, and what that means is you all link and join arms and support one another. So they do that. So they all stand, these 50 sachems, and they all grab each other's forearms, linking this 50 uh, sachems together. So now he says, And what that means is you form a circle. So he says, he says, now you will surround your crowd or your people. So this is where they stand in a circle around the great tree of peace and they form this strong link from sachem to sachem all around in this circle. And in the center is the great white uh, pine tree, the tree of peace. Inside the circle, also, with the Tree of Peace, the Tree of Peace is sheltering the people from different levels. The ceremonial leaders, the faith keepers, the people with no titles, whom we call which means they have no ceremonial attachment to them. The children, who have different levels. In our language, we start off by saying, Hadik sa so'o. And what that literally means, the children that are running in and around between us. The ones who are still attached, uh, or they're dragging the dust. So we say, And that's literally what that means. To the babies who are on the board, and we say, uh, which means they're on the splint. Uh, and what that means is their bodies are attached to it. So within this circle, um, this is where the um, peacemaker give them their instructions that they are always to stand in this circle because one day a strong wind may come and rock that tree back and forth. If the tree should happen to fall, it will, it will not hit the ground and it'll land on this linking arm of the sachems or what we call hudiyanisho. And they'll work together all as one to stand it back up. So when you see the 13 colonies and when you see them linking arms, this is George Washington adopting these principles that he have come that he had come so well to know from all his years among the Haudenosaunee whether it was diplomatic or on the battlefield he took that same idea and he applied it to the colonies he said that we have these little colonies and we're all going to join arms and this bond will be really strong to the point where that if our nation should come to a point of trouble, each colony will support the other and will lift it back up. So this is the way that we understand this wampum belt. And this is, the, and this is how we look at it. These, this wampum belt and the symbology that is in the wampum belt that was dictated to these Oneida women by George Washington is something based is based on principles that we have already known for many generations.
It was nothing new to us. The use of wampum was nothing new to us. <coughs> uh, this is one of my uh, relatives. Um, and his, he come to settle at Tanawanda. Uh, his name um, was uh, Henry Infant. That was his English name. And he had a very distinct uh, Seneca name. Uh, and his uh, Seneca name was um, uh, Sagogoikon. And what that means is they're like using their fist on one another, like they're fighting. Um, and Henry Infant was about six and a half feet tall. Uh, and he actually goes to Philadelphia in 1792. And this is where the two parties, along with Red Jacket, Corn Planter, uh, Skanyadayu, they travel there to begin the terms or they begin these talks of peace. Henry Infant he eventually settles at Tanawanda and he gives birth to a whole line of men there at Tanawanda. And the name up until around the 1940s, 1950s, was still in use as the last name or surname as Infant. And in fact, uh, I, um, they, they were sachem chiefs of the Seneca Nation. Uh, so Ama, so uh, Amos Infant, and uh, he had a brother, and they gave birth um, to more uh, men of this same lineage. But anyway, uh, my point is, is that this treaty was meant to survive well into the future for the descendants of the Seneca and Haudenosaunee people. And I am a turtle clan of the Tanawanda Seneca, and my mother was a turtle clan of the Tanawanda Seneca, my grandmother, and they are the descendants of this man and his sisters. So the Canadago Treaty, uh, just like um, the citizens of the United States, was meant to last well into the future for what we call in Seneca, Diego Sondages. Da means coming this way. Ye means hers. The agos means the faces. And then the ondajes means to be progressively coming. Dayego sondajes means the up and coming faces. So I'm very proud. And I, I, one, of my, one, of the, uh, one of my things that I love doing is, is I, I love highlighting this man because he went there in 1792 with the vision of making sure that his descendants would be able to live in peace and with the free use of their land. And that was one of the um, things that they agreed upon at the time at the signing of the Canadago Treaty. Uh, it's one of the articles, the free use and enjoyment of their land. And this is my direct linked link to the Canadago Treaty uh, because I know that he went there with the best intention of guarantee, uh, guaranteeing that to me today. And I am able to do that today uh, because of um, one of my ancestors, uh, the infant, uh, Henry Infant. Uh, this is another symbol that's very identifiable to all people uh, today, and it's making its way around the world and showing up on t-shirts and flags and uh, bumper stickers and tattoos uh, by Haudenosaunee and non-Haudenosaunee. Uh, but this is the, what we say, when he finds, when he says, um, where he brings the five nations together. <coughs> uh, this is the young corn planter. Um, this is another person who was accompanying the groups of the group of Seneca that went to Philadelphia in 1792. <clears throat> so uh, this here, um, it's a, it's an object that may not be a, too identifiable to 
even Haudenosaunee people today. Uh, but what this is, is it's a mat made of what we call the bulrush reed. In Seneca and other languages uh, of the Haudenosaunee, the word for bulrush is we say, uh, is we say onoda, or we say ganoda, which is the actual plant itself. Onoda is the bulrush that's been picked and plucked from the earth and processed to use into another uh, different object, which is the mat. So the bulrush plant, the plant itself is called gunoda because it's the plant, it's the agent. And then the bulrush mat, because it's twined all from bulrush, is called onoda. Haudenosaunee women um, had made these on a regular basis. And in fact, when they did not have enough bulrush or long bulrushes, tall bulrushes, they would often travel to other lands just to procure long enough bulrushes to produce these very long and wide, what we call bulrush mats or onoda. So what they would do is they would twine these mats made of bulrush reeds and use them as a utilitarian object to sleep on. But what happens is when the men go off into battle, or what we call adios hat, which is the war path, they would carry these with them on their backs to sleep on. And they carried small versions of them. So what happens is they become symbols of warfare. And a term, a suffix is added, or a verb root is added to this noun root, onoda. And the verb root that's added to onoda is gehte, which means to bear on one's shoulder, and it becomes onoda gehte. And that becomes the traditional and ritualistic term for warfare. So what happens is the women take part, uh, the, they take part in this and what they do is they twine these mats for the men and what they start to do is they begin to twine and they begin to dye certain bulrushes, different colors and they twine in, um, oftentimes they twine in colors and designs that are indicative of warfare. Why? Because it's showing that they support them. It's showing that they'll do what they can to support their men on the war path and to ensure their comfort and to make sure that they find their way home. The colors and object are the colors and symbols that are woven into the mats were medicine to protect their husbands, to protect their brothers, to protect their uncles and to make sure that they come home. And hence why it becomes a symbol for warfare, because it makes its way from a utilitarian object to the symbol, and the symbol is meant to, as medicine to protect their men and show comfort and their support. <clears throat> so what happens is, we can get a really good idea even from when the French arrive in the New World uh, in the late 16th century and they make their way into Haudenosaunee territory in the 17th century. Uh, here we have um, a Seneca dictionary that was written in French by one of the French Jesuits, which we think was either Brujas or Julien Garnier. Julien Garnier was um, the head missionary to the Seneca, and he spent 20 years amongst us uh, in the 17th century. So as you can see, we have the second entry is Ondota. Uh, that D goes through a phonological change later on and it disappears. So what we have today is we have Onoda. And here he gives us the French translation for the mat. A derivative of this Ondota is right underneath. And here we see the term Ondotagehte, or what we say now pronounced as Onodagehte, which is the warfare 
And he even has the French term for the god of war, uh, Le Mars. So we see his word for soldiers or warriors. Uh, so he says uh, right here, Houdino Dagete. And we see the word that we use even today, Houdiske uh, Engeto. So uh, what happens is, is that this war mat becomes visible in Haudenosaunee culture. We see it in prisoner tump lines that are made and embroidered with moose hair and embellished with porcupine quill work and tin cones and red deer hair. So we see the war mats on this prisoner cord that's been embellished and embroidered with dyed moose hair. Haudenosaunee women uh, historically uh, and even in our old tradition were known for their moose hair embroidery work. Um, so what happens is they start putting charms into these war mats. And what happens is, again, in the peacemaker's journey, what he says is he says that the war mat or the mat has become stained with blood. So what he says is he says that now that all the five nations have agreed to these principles of peace, power, and friendship, we will take a white cloth and we will wipe that war mat clean. So what we have is we have now a white mat the symbology was, I guess, in effect, wiped away off these bulrush mats. And what happens is now we have the term Jonodagangowa. So in Haudenosaunee language, when we take either a verb or most times a noun, and we want to use it and apply it for a specific name, what we do in Haudenosaunee language is we apply what we call the repetitive pronominal prefix or the letter S. We have the yo, which is the patient or the objective pronoun, it. Something happens to it. So that S and the Y come together to form the J sound, jo. We have the verb or the noun root for bulrush or the bulrush mat, noda. We have an applied suffix for the term white, the gan, jonoda gan. And we have goa, which augments it, jonoda gan goa, the great white mat of the new, what we call Haudenosaunee. So the mat has been wiped clean and now it is free of blood. And what the peacemaker says is he says, Songa ton sayudque. Uh, he says, Songa uh, ton sayudque sight. What that means is nobody will ever shed bloodshed anymore. So when we see this, you have to remember that it starts off and one of the th and one of my goals in life is to make sure that we correct history and instead of saying wampum belt we say wampum mat because if you look at these these objects they don't look like belts at all they're very wide they're very um long and they have symbols woven into them. In fact, these belts or these mats, the way the beads that are applied to the leather warps are twisted and they're applied bead by bead and they're not done on a loom, which has become the conventional way and contemporary way of producing replica wampum belts today. Um, but Tech, the, the technical way of putting these belt, these wampum mats together 
is you have this twisted hemp cordage and then the bead goes over the twist and then it's twisted again and then a bead twist bead twist bead twist bead twist and so on which is the exact same way that these belts or that these um, bulrush mats are produced they're twisted and they're twined um, all along these long wefts. So in our language, we say and it's based and we say the great white mat um, of the Haudenosaunee. So at Kenadegua, um, or Ganondegwe, what happens is that 10 years before 1794, the Senecas were, our ancient homeland of the Senecas is what we call Genesee. And it's often referred to as Geneseo. But the traditional name is supposed to be pronounced Geneseo, which means the place of the good sand. And you hear that J again on the, uh, on the beginning. And that's because the word for sand is being used for a specific name and not beer, as most people often know it. <clears throat> so, Jonisio, the Senecas were all along this Jonisio River. We settled there, you know, th you know, over a thousand years ago, and we've lived there right up until about 1783, 1784. Because one of the things that happens in 1783 is we have the ending of what we call the Revolutionary War. And in 1783 in September, we have the signing of what we call the Treaty of Paris, which is the understanding and agreement between the monarchy in Great Britain and the colonies of the New World, and they are become independent. But what happens is in this Treaty of Paris, Great Britain relinquishes the physical land um, and forfeits that land over to the new 13 colonies or the United States. Because that was the doctrine of war at the time, was if you lose the battle, you forfeit the land. But what's not mentioned in this Treaty of Paris when Great Britain forfeits the land is the original inhabitants, which are the indigenous peoples of North America. And the Haudenosaunee are not uh, mentioned in this Treaty of Paris. So the United States takes possession of this new land. And what happens is in 1784, on uh, January, you know, Congress ratifies this Treaty of Paris and it becomes legal now. But again, there's no mention of the Haudenosaunee and any other indigenous groups in this Treaty of Paris. So what happens is that with this knowledge and with this understanding of the United States being the ruling, um, the supreme ruler of the land, this one we come to the United States and say, hey, wait a minute, we have our own land in what you are now calling the United States. We're not going anywhere. So this has to be worked out. So what happens is the United States, uh, they set up a treaty to be um, negotiated at what we call Fort Stanwix. So in 1784, a large group of Senecas and a small number of delegates of the other six nations, they travel to Fort Stanwix in 1784 and they do their best to try and negotiate the best way possible to come to terms of peace. But what ultimately happens is that a lot of the Seneca leaders and other Haudenosaunee delegates and chiefs that show up, they don't speak English. 
And what happens is that they signed this treaty at Fort Stanwix in 1784 without realizing that in this treaty, what they do is they relinquish a lot of land, a lot of Seneca lands along the Geneseo River. So what happens is that the chiefs that come home and realize what they've done a few years later, they get scolded by the clan mothers because the women are the stewards of the land. Because for many, 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 many hundreds of generations, it was the women who worked the land for, on behalf of the Haudenosaunee, and they made the decisions when it came time to plant crops, where to settle new villages. So they told the chiefs, you better do something about this. So that's when the Seneca chiefs, along with other nation, uh, Haudenosaunee leaders, chiefs, and delegates, go back to the United States and they say, we need to either cancel this treaty because we didn't understand the English. So we want to make sure that what was done wrong is done right. So what happens is the U.S. comes back and says, we've already ratified this. Your leaders' signatures are on this treaty and we cannot reverse or cancel or void treaties. So what they do is they start entering new turn or they start the talks of possibly making a new treaty then to at least stop what was being done at the time. And what was being done at the time was the relinquishing of a lot of homelands, especially the Seneca homelands. <laughs> so what happens is that the chiefs, who the uh, Seneca chiefs, which a lot of them are located at what we now call the city of Buffalo, but before that it was, it was a Seneca territory, which we call Doshowe, which literally means split basswood. They're all at Buffalo. And of course, Buffalo sits right on the banks of the Allegheny River, or not the Allegheny, the Niagara River. And who is sitting right across, just a couple hundred feet away, across the Niagara River? It's the British. So Timothy Pickering sends a letter to the chiefs, and he says, we've heard your concerns, and I've been designated to come and negotiate terms of a new treaty. So he writes a letter to the chiefs at uh, Doshowen. And the chiefs say, well, Buffalo Creek is where we meet and we discuss, turn, we, we, we discuss matters that involve the Confederacy. So if you're going to negotiate any treaties, it's going to be done here in Buffalo or at Buffalo Creek. So Timothy Pickering writes back and says, that's not going to happen. And the reason why that's not going to happen is because the British are too close to, this, to your territory. So we would like to choose a different spot. So ultimately, they settle on this little town, uh, which we now call Gonondagwe, or Canandaigua. The Seneca leaders, along with the other chiefs of the Haudenosaunee, they peacefully agree that that's where they'll meet. So, but before that, they come, uh, the different chiefs, they go to the clan mothers, and that's what they say, is they say, we're going to do our best now to put in, to put, to write the things that were wronged about a decade ago. So they, with their permission, they go to Canadagua, a uh, handsome lake, and the other leaders uh, of the uh, Haudenosaunee. But what they do is they bring an ally with them because they didn't understand English very well, especially written English, because one of the things that they never really done before, especially in the war, uh, in the Seven Years War or the French and Indian War, was they write treaties on vellum or pieces of paper. So what they do is they come to Gunandagwe with an ally, and those allies are the Quakers. 
and it's the Quakers who act as a neutral party because they understand English very well and they understand English, uh, written English very well, but they also understand Seneca language, which makes them the perfect person um, to act as a neutral party. So what they do is they come forward and they s agree because even they understand that, okay, if you're gonna have a treaty, you have to make sure both sides understand fully what's being put on this, this vellum or parchment, whatever you wanna call it. And they finally make, uh, and they finally sign to it. So the Quakers, even still, still, still to this day on November 11th, every year, they send a representative to Canadagua at this um, recognition of the Canadagua Treaty and they still recognize the part that they took um, with these negotiations between the U.S. Indian agent Timothy Pickering and the chiefs and clan mothers, faith keepers, people and children of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And we're very grateful for that. So what happens is after many, many days and meetings in the fall of 1794, they finally come to an agreement in what we now call the Treaty of Ganondegwe, or in Seneca, we say, um, that means the treaty at Canandaigua. George Washington brings the wampum belt. He sends it with Timothy Pickering because George Washington never actually went to Gunnandagwe. Uh, he never actually stepped foot there during this whole time uh, because he entrusted Timothy Pickering to do the job and he did it. Just like the clan mothers sent their chiefs and their delegates, uh, some of them did come because we know for a fact that what happens is that it's not just the Haudenosaunee that um, arrive at, Canand uh, at Canandaigua. Um, there's other groups, uh, such as the Delaware. Uh, and in fact, there was a traditional condolence held or a wood woods edge ceremony uh, that took place there. Uh, and again, this is a custom, a long-standing custom among the Haudenosaunee to welcome groups to a place where there was going to be a ceremony that takes place, just like we still do today when raising a new sachem. So they call this ceremony uh, which means along the thorny edge or wood's edge. But what it, what, that's literally what it means, is it means along, along the edge of the thistles. There they perform three bare words or in our language, we say Adondashat, the wiping of the tears. Because what they say is they say that on this journey here, you have encountered beast in the wild. You have encountered obstacles sticking up from the ground, such as rivers, waterfalls, boulders, mountains, lakes, rivers, and streams. Along the way, some of you may have perished because of these. And now as you arrive at this place, the tears are falling from your eyes. So what we do is we wipe away these tears, even if it's for the period of one day. And in the language, that's exactly what they say. What they say is they say, what that means is they pass their finger through the tears, meaning they wipe it away. Even if it's for the period of one day, you'll see clearly. Why? Because if you're there to negotiate a treaty, you have to be able to see clearly what it is that you're agreeing to. The next bear word is what they call the removal of grief from the ears. So what they say is they say, And what that means is that 
the ear, inside of your ear has become tight and puckered because of grief. So really what they're doing is what they say is the opening of your ear has become like this. So what they do is they say, meaning they pass their finger through your ear and they go like this. That's literally what that means. So now you can hear things that are going on around you, even if it's for the period of one day. Because if you're there to negotiate a treaty, then you should be able to hear very clearly what it is that you're speaking about and counseling about with the other party and amongst yourselves. The next bare word is the clearing of the throat. They say the same thing. What they say is they say that your esophagus has become puckered and tight because of grief. So what they say is they say the same thing. Why nan yong good? They shanya do gan onyan da. Your throat has become puckered because of grief. So what they do is they pass their finger into your esophagus again, opening it up, so that you can speak and breathe clearly. Because once again, if you're negotiating a treaty, you should be able to speak your words with the utmost breath that the Creator has given you, even if it's for the period of one day. So our people perform this ceremony for one another prior to entering into any negotiations at the Treaty of Ganondagwe on November 11th, 1794. Because, again, what I had said before is that the Gayon Dako, you have to see clearly, you have to hear clearly, and you should be able to speak clearly. And if all those three elements are running strong, then you should be able to think and uh, come to terms of peace, power, and friendship. Just like the peacemaker did many generations prior to the Europeans ever arriving in North America, is he said to the five nations, you cannot see anything because your eyes are in these perpetual tears because of the warfare that is taking place every day. You cannot hear anything. You can't hear your people in agony because of the perpetual warfare and you cannot swallow anything. You can't speak because of the perpetual agony that you are in. So what I do is I'd perform this three bare words so that all you people can now enjoy peace, power, and friendship forever into the future, even if it's for only a period of one day. If I have to do it again tomorrow, I will do it again tomorrow. So the five nations and all the nations, the six nations that attended the treaty at Gunandagwe, they made sure that they were able to see clearly, hear clearly, and speak clearly prior to entering any negotiations. So the treaty of Gunandagwe, that's how it starts. And how it ends goes down in history as what we now call the Treaty of Canandaigua. The Timothy Pickering Treaty is this treaty based on the silver covenant chain of friendship between the United States and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We have to remind them all the time, perpetually, the United States, that you are the other side of this treaty. And this is what we agreed to. In contemporary times, we're often bombarded with questions and investigations from the U.S. government on what it is that we do with our land. How do we enjoy our land? Well, we have to remind them that, that that's not up to you. It's up to us to dictate how we enjoy the free use 
of our land and enjoyment of it, just like you agreed in this treaty. So in contemporary times, in my time, uh, I'm 40 years old, and we're still, still having to remind them that these are the agreements, this is the agreement that we have. In the 1950s, my ancestors, at, with the building of the Kinzawa Dam and the inundation of these lands being flooded down on the Allegheny Seneca Territory, we had to remind them before the building of this dam that this is what you agreed to and now you're breaking this treaty. But the U.S. government went ahead and did what they wanted to anyway. And again, uh, even today in my home territory, um, just outside the territory, we have a uh, hydrogen plant in the works of being built right on the edge, the literal edge of our territory uh, and threatening our hunting lands where we hunt. Um, so we have to remind them that this is what you agreed to um, and we have to do our best to come forward and to remember this alliance because that's what it is. It's an alliance because they're all standing equal <clears throat> or de uh, you know, that we're all in this together. So um, this is how we, Seneca, uh, look at the Gonandagua Treaty. This is our perspective. There's a historical perspective, um, again, that scholars, well, you know, you can read about. Um, you can read about those details, um, but traditionally, um, this is how we see it, and this is what we see leading up to it, uh, and even still today. The Silver Chain Covenant, um, now you know that it starts out as a chain of men grasping arms in the formation of the five, uh, the formation of the, what we call Ganoshonido. The bundling of the five arrows resonates even today. If you take a dollar bill out of your pocket and look at the back, you see 13 arrows. It's being grasped by the eagle and the bald eagle sits on top of the tree of peace. It's grasping an olive branch, which represents peace. The eagle is extending it. Well, the eagle is grasping the tree of peace and protecting and extending the roots of the, of the great white peace into the four cardinal directions, calling all those under its branches, just like we see Tadodaho and George Washington here on this wampum belt. Um, <clears throat> so again, like even prior, like 60 years prior, uh, even 70 years prior to the signing of this treaty, Caldwell or Cauldron attends meetings in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in the 1720s, where the Haudenosaunee chiefs are encouraging them, uh, even then the colonies, to, f to join and they'll stand stronger as, uh, as united. So he goes on to publish a book that I mentioned even at the beginning of my lecture um, or my presentation uh, called The History of the Five Nations by Caldwell de Cauldron. So he's reading or he's sending his minutes back to Philadelphia uh, to be printed. And it's none other than Benjamin Franklin who becomes later on one of the forefathers of the United States. And he starts his own campaign based on some of the things that he's hearing about and reading about what we call, or what we now recognize as join or die. The snake cut into different pieces. Um, so in the history books, uh, we can see even the Europeans side of the history. Um, and we can read about their interpretations of native treaties. Um, Sir William Johnson, if you read the Sir William Johnson papers, you can just read all throughout his papers and dealings with the Haudenosaunee that there's a traditional way of coming to a diplomatic agreement uh, with the use of wampum mats uh, and different, you know, articles. <clears throat> so, um, again, um, this is the Seneca perspective, and I really hope that 
it gives you an, uh, another understanding, another way of understanding the, uh, the Canandaigua Treaty. Um, and I really hope that I was able to offer you a lot more insight uh, into it, uh, because it's more than just a piece of parchment, or it's more than just a piece of vellum uh, with, words, uh, with words written on them. Uh, there's many, many layers uh, to this. Um, and there's, it's more than just articles. It's understanding the fact that there's two parties and what they had to do in order to even, before they even started negotiating uh, these articles uh, at the Treaty of Canandaigua in 1794. So every year on November 11th, what is now dubbed Veterans Day, uh, in the city or the township of Canandaigua, um, we have a meeting at the courthouse and at what they call the Rock, where we commemorate the treaty uh, every year. And again, like I said, uh, we do our best because one of the things that we had an understanding of at the signing of this treaty is that the covenant chain would have to be polished uh, every so often. And at that time, there was no four-year um, term limit for the presidents. So I'm not sure what the original time was at that time. I think it might have been 10 years because that term, uh, that 10 year period, uh, we see it all throughout our culture. Um, so we think, I think at that time it was every 10 years, the covenant chain would have to be polished. Uh, but that hasn't been done um, in person by a president and who knows how long. So every year we do our best to try and call the president to come forward and symbolically polish the silver covenant chain of friendship. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's three surviving um, known copies of the treaty. This one here, which still remains at Tonawanda, even to this day. You can see one at the historical society in the township of Canandaigua. It's just down the street from um, the courthouse. And then the original one that was ratified uh, by Congress uh, um, that sits in the National Archives. It was recently on exhibit at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. Uh, it, was, it was referred to as the grandfather of all treaties because it is one of the first major treaties between the United States and an indigenous group of people. Um, and it was the first treaty you saw when you walked into the exhibit um, at the NMAI there. Um, so, um, I really, and again, this, this kind of sets the way um, for, you know, the, the rest of the treaty making. In fact, one of the things that was agreed upon that's not in the treaty that happens after this is that some of the Seneca leaders were asked by the U.S. to go out and speak with the Western nations and advise them on how to come to terms with treaty negotiations and treaties between them and the U.S. government. And Joseph Brandt didn't like that. And he just hadn't, he didn't want anything to do with it. Um, but what happens is that Corn Planter, um, Governor Blacksnake, and other Seneca leaders, they make the journey west and they visit the Shawnee nations. Uh, they go off uh, past the Ohio Valley, uh, up into Michigan, uh, and they meet with uh, other nations to kind of advise them and even encourage sometimes to make treaty with uh, the U.S. because we've kind of already come to terms that this is what has to be done, or the other alternative is to go ahead and declare war with the United States, but it's not going to do anybody any good. Uh, and that's what happens. Um, so um, that's a Seneca perspective on the Treaty of Gondandagwe. Uh, a little bit of cultural insight, something, some things I know that you, may, you probably won't read in any book um, based on the Canandaigua Treaty. Um, so 
I really hope that you enjoyed uh, this little uh, interpretation here tonight by myself. Um, and COVID kind of put a little damper on the commemoration ceremony that takes place every year. But this year, I've heard that they are going to meet only at the Rock um, for the commemoration and the little ceremony there. Um, and they will not be doing um, the after um, the after party. That's what you want to call it. Um, they won't be doing the after gathering at the gymnasium uh, at the school there. But hopefully next year, things might get back a little bit more to normal and we'll be able to all meet, uh, celebrate with social songs and a meal uh, like we normally do. Uh, but this year, it's only going to be done at The Rock. Um, so um, hope to see you there. Uh, and every year after that, um, because they always say that on November 11th, they call it Treaty Day. But the treaty was meant to last in oral tradition. As long as the sun shines, as long as the grass grows green, and as long as the water flows. So today the sun was shining on my journey here. The rivers were still flowing and the grass were still green. So in a sense, every day is treaty day, not just November 11th, um, you know, every year. So um, that's my presentation here tonight. I hope you got a lot out of it. And thank you so much for giving me your utmost uh, required attention and um, your devotion for this little time period. Um, so thank you so much. And that concludes my presentation. <laughs>